Well, hello, this is Jason T. Ingram. I'm a multimedia artist and activist when it comes to mental health issues, especially harmful forms of mental health or things that look like mental health or do the work of mental health and actually do a lot of harm, often doing more harm than good. And people will uh, give it a name like biblical counseling or something like that when it's really not um, like clinical based mental health work that takes into consideration what are the overall effects of what happens when uh, you hear a problem from somebody especially if they're dealing with debilitating mental disorders and somebody just sort of prescribes these bible scriptures and talks uh, and says this is what the bible says and da 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 and this is what you should do and uh you know, the biblical counseling model doesn't necessarily say you do these Hail Marys and call me in the morning. <laughs> and there are some similarities, though, in the Protestant world when it comes to applying spiritual principles to things that need clinical care. And so that's something that I see as a trend. I did see, uh, as far as what I know about history, is that there was a, a trend with a lot of counseling back in the 80s with a lot of um, born-again type churches. And uh, then it got flaky, and then they started doing this shepherding movement and things like that, which was basically like, uh, for, for lack of a better term, what color suit should I wear today? I have to call my shepherd mentor person and you know get their opinion about everything. And so I have a long list of stuff I want to go through today. I'm actually using notes this time, but I still have crappy lighting. I'm using one of those depression lights, those full spectrum lights. It makes me look extra creepy. <laughs> and I'm here in my travel trailer in central Oregon. And I've been thinking um, a lot over the last several years about how do I incorporate healthy things when it comes to the Christian faith. And I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't want to just say, I'm going to totally throw out the fundamentals of Christianity, the authority of the Bible and God himself. And then that's exactly what I did. <laughs> I didn't expect that. But sometimes it's good to start over with a clean slate. Uh, because if I have just renounced everything then hopefully if there's something that really is true that really is helpful hopefully it will come back and i've been able to get uh, into the bible again and to speak some things over myself um, but it's just that i've tried to for lack of a better term sanitize the christian faith and i i think a lot of like liberal type progressive churches want to sanitize all of the uh, hyper aggressive um, the uh, hyper rule book type moral codes and stuff like that. And when you end up with a sanitized version of Christianity, you lose all the good stuff too. And you, you lose the, the very thing that I think Christianity is founded on, which is either faith or <laughs> what a lot of people say, especially outside of the church, which is blind faith, which is not a classic rock super group that I think only made one album and then they all had ego trips and whatever. <laughs> blind faith is something that I experienced a lot and something I realized when I went to uh, the former Soviet areas is that these were people who were raised under a mentality where they submit to authority. You don't question it. And their faith was amazing. And they had a lot of spiritual results. And people will talk about going into Eastern Europe and different places around the world where folks are very, for lack of a better term, submissive. And so I, I went to this school here, and I'm even wearing the shirt here. It's uh, called Rama Bible Training Center, and I attended that school from 1997 to 99. And uh, you can see here that their, their school is founded on this passage in Mark 11:23 that you will have what you say. And there's, there are some spiritual principles in that. In fact, the law of attraction, if you go into metaphysics and a lot of other religious principles, um, talk about, you know, positive confession and stuff like that. And I think there are principles that 
work for a lot of people with that. It's just what happens is that you end up getting this thing that I'm going to call the confession police, you know, where someone says, oh, I'm so sick and I'm so poor and I'm so miserable. And then you get somebody who says, I rebuke that. You don't say that over yourself because God has given you a period and blah, blah, blah. And they start quoting scriptures at you and they go, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I better speak positive about myself because the Bible says I have what I say. And if I say bad stuff, bad stuff will happen. And I, I liked the school because I was very sick and I was very poor and I wanted to go to a school that taught people about prosperity and uh, supernatural healing and all that kind of stuff. So I ended up going there for two years. I had a pastoral ministry certificate and I ended up even more poor and more sick because of all the stress and trying to work one or two jobs and trying to study. And with that environment, with all the hype, and um, it was exhausting. And uh, I ended up really getting burned out. And there was a lot of good things that happened with that church and that school. And there was definitely a lot of harm. I do think that the guy who started it, this Kenneth E. Hagen, um, from a metaphysical perspective, he really did tap into something that was really beyond this world. And I shook his hand one time and it put me into a spiritual experience. And I think it was very valid. And I think that maybe some people could look at it as uh, somebody who has an incredible amount of hypnotic suggestion, especially when I was talking about folks like Rodney Howard Brown and that family of this laughing revival type stuff. We did have some of that kind of influence as well. And you get these folks like uh, the Word of Faith movement, which was, you know, really founded upon Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland's stuff, and maybe some other Kenneths <laughs> that got a hold of these principles that were mentioned, not very often, but mentioned in the Bible and mentioned in a lot of other religious and mind science type stuff. And uh, we were accused of uh, dabbling in metaphysics, even though a lot of it was very similar. We were accused of being a cult because we did have some separatist type mentalities and some elitist type mentalities. But, um, Something else, too, is that we had a class, and I kid you not, and we had some weird classes. There was a class that was called Blood Covenant. I'm serious. That was the name of the course. I got an A in Blood Covenant. <laughs> and it was a study of the New Testament about how it relates to the Old Testament and the crucifixion. And um, this blood was sort of this opening where people could have a relationship with God um, through a blood sacrifice. I mean, that's just weird. It's actually, uh, some of the symbols and principles are actually synonymous with Satanism, <laughs> which I think is kind of funny. But anyways, what happened was um, my grandparents, who were not at all born-again Christians, uh, they didn't practice any faith at all. They had a little bit of background in, in Methodist stuff, but my grandpa was an atheist, my grandpa Ingram, and my grandmother was more of an earth worshiper. And they were nice enough because they were just happy that I was going to some kind of institution of education. They didn't care what it was. But, and it was only like $1,700 a year. It was part-time. It was three or four hours a day. And I'd send them my report cards. And I was a little embarrassed to send them one of my report cards, even though I got A's in most of it. But it was really, the, the tests were really easy. And there was also a class, I kid you not, I think the teacher was Keith Moore, who was really an intense guy, like a, a formal martial arts guy. And um, actually a pretty good songwriter, too. So he was just an all-around interesting guy. He drove a Lincoln Navigator. He had a beard. He was just a badass. And he had a class. And, and I know I've been... Uh, drum roll, please, because it was such a funny title. It was called Submission and Authority. And it was all about uh, going in depth about how 
people are to submit to God, submit to your leaders, submit to your government. Of course, there are exceptions if, if somebody thinks that God's telling them something or if the Bible tells them something or if they interpret the Bible as something, then, you know, they throw this submission and authority all out the window, which happens quite often. And of course, that's where a lot of conflict is because you get people saying, well, God told me this. And then the pastor says, I don't think God told you that. And then the pastor says, God told me this. I'm going to build this big sanctuary. And then nobody shows up. And then they say, they apologize to the congregation. They say, I missed God. And it's it's kind of a funny term when someone says, I missed God. Uh, I've heard that a lot. Um, there's a lot of funny lingo um, when it comes to this culture, especially the word of faith movement, you know, um, that's a bad confession, you know, um, uh, and this whole thing about we're like sheep and sheep are just generally stupid. And so there's this idea that we are to see ourselves as these stupid creatures as that have to submit to something higher than us. And I think that works for some people because a lot of people really are stupid and they do need oversight. And I know I was making a lot of bad choices in my life. And I liked having people speak into my life because I didn't have a lot of practical common sense. And another thing about this school that I went to, half of what they were saying was, was like flaky stuff. The other half was very practical. They had a lot of classes about like this is how you organize a children's ministry and this is uh, things to do when you're doing a youth ministry and um, people from the industry that had been pastoring and touring and missions work um, would end up teaching there and they would get people that were successful at it and then they would end up teaching there they had really high standards for a lot of their teachers it's just that they didn't have a lot of academic standards and so I would ask them theological questions, and um, I didn't get a studious response. But this is another thing that I noticed about this culture, is that these people respond to power um, and not necessarily information and fact-checking and logic and stuff like that. So uh, you get somebody that is from a studious background that they have a, a degree in, and I think this is funny too, a degree in divinity from a recognized university of religious studies around the world and you know learning about people's spiritual experiences hundreds and thousands of years ago. And that's the kind of stuff that I grew up in as well. Uh, but you get somebody like that and uh, I like to make fun of liberal theologians because a lot of times they have this whiny voice like, um, sir, uh, excuse me, but um, I have learned because of my background and my education that uh, these type of people had this type of experience and blah, 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 blah. And they have a lot of credibility to what they're saying from some perspective. And then you get somebody over on this other side, for instance, like this Keith Moore guy, who's like got this background as a martial arts quintuple black belt or whatever. And he's really fucking intense. And you get different people that will respond to different aspects of what they're saying. And then you get a guy that says, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. That's something I heard around Bible school as well. <clears throat> and one time, uh, I don't know why I said this, <clears throat> because I don't know if it was just something I was repeating what people were saying, and that, that, that happened too, because it's a little creepy. I keep hearing these same things over and over again, and I would repeat them because that's just what we did. But I also did it because I like to freak out my family too. <laughs> And so one time we're having this argument about the, uh, uh, my faith and all this stuff and me thinking that, you know, I'm right and they're wrong and that kind of stuff. And I told my mother, uh, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it, totally freaked her out. And uh, <clears throat> so there's stuff that we said that wasn't necessarily 
uh, theologically correct. It wasn't necessarily psychologically helpful. It wasn't necessarily in the Bible. It's just that we, we said this stuff. And then at Bible school, they would challenge a lot of those kinds of things, you know. Like there was a, a passage in Hebrews where people interpret it as, God will never put more on you that you can bear. And they go, well, the Bible doesn't say that. It says that you, you will not be tempted beyond what you can, blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. And so that definitely gave us kind of an attitude that, well, we have the truth. I even heard the dean of the school um, talking about the school doctrine as compared to the the type of denomination that he originally was in, which was uh, maybe Baptist or something like that. And he said, I'm glad I know the truth. And I remember I thought, oh my God, that's a little creepy uh, because um, saying that one particular form of Christianity compared to another form of Christianity is the truth. <clears throat> Ugh, I, I just didn't like that. But I did pretty much swallow the Kool-Aid when it came to a lot of the stuff there. Um, for instance, we did have the laughing and shouting and, and, and running and dancing kind of stuff that went on, even in some of the school sessions that were open to the public. And so... Um, there was a lot of that stuff where you yield your mind and even you yield your body to an atmosphere where everybody is doing a lot of crazy. And for people that are suffering from sickness and uh, depression, especially those that are poor, that's an amazing environment to be around. And it's, and it's really um, uh, appealing for people who are really suffering. And I have had experiences, too, like in Alaska, and I still like to keep an open mind that, one, there really could have been um, a miracle healing experience for somebody, and it very well could have just been people that were caught up in a mass kind of um, a hallucination or a mass uh, uh, a hypnotic experience, and... Also, from a uh, theological perspective, uh, I do believe in the existence of demons, and I do believe that a lot of demons can actually influence this world in a way that could cause um, especially mental ailments and maybe physical ailments too. But anyways, one in particular, I was pretty new at the whole Christian thing, and there was a healing revival going on. And there was an older native Alaskan woman who just gets really excited. And she said that uh, her ears were stopped and they opened up uh, and she could like hear when she couldn't hear before. And I've had experiences through prayer where I have um, been convinced that there was definitely <clears throat> something supernatural when it came to answered prayer. And from a metaphysical perspective, I can interpret that. And from a psychological perspective, if I talk about it enough, I could probably explain it away, which is what a lot of post-Christians like to do. And I like to keep an open mind that it could very well be all of the above or a combination of all that stuff. It's just that faith healing, that environment, that community, that whole mentality, is incredibly toxic if people stay in that. And what typically happens, and, and this is something that they even taught us in our Bible school, because here it was um, decades after the Voice of Healing movement with people like uh, uh, Kenneth E. Hagan worked very closely with people like Oral Roberts, and then um, there was a missionary that also um, was involved in a lot of faith healing too that wasn't really well known in the United States. I can't remember his name, but he's, he's wonderful. I love the guy. He's kind of a hippie type. Um, and most of these guys, uh, like Jack Coe, I think is an interesting example of somebody who really got off and, you know, they would be this amazing movement of the spirit. And then he would take an offering during that because people were really vulnerable and stuff like that. Well, most of them ended up in horrible failures um, after the 1950s thing. And then there was also this weird phenomenon going on is that there were a lot of people that would testify of being healed physically 
like at, especially at an Oral Roberts meeting, and then you talk to these people um, years later or months or maybe even days after that experience, and they said, well, I was healed, and then I went home and I was sick again. And I think that there very well could be uh, the influence of entities um, or what some people might call demons or that there might even been some kind of weird angels from another world that <clears throat> could have been influencing people in ways that could manifest as some type of physical ailment. And I've had experiences a lot where I'd be reading the Psalms or I'd be worshiping and I would be in a really intense depression and I would just feel like a black cloud would lift. Uh, this, uh, the first time that ever happened uh, was at like a young adult youth worship service. And uh, it was really profound and I got on stage and I, it was like I was overcome by something and I was singing in the spirit. And uh, that's another thing too that is really hard to explain uh, when it comes to what they call the gifts of the Spirit. And this is from the um, non-dispensationalists. And I talked a little bit about how Baptists um, have a doctrine of dispensationalism, saying that a dispensation is like, for instance, God dealt with people in the in the covenant of Abraham in that dispensation in a certain way, and they were certain there was a different rule book. Like polygamy might have been okay, but not okay in the New Testament dispensation. And then after the apostles died out, there was sort of the dispensation of faith, where you take the Bible you know, pretty literally, and you explain the heck out of it, and that becomes your anchor. Well, the the charismatic, full gospel, Pentecostal, tongue-talking, whatever type of folks that I was running with, we weren't necessarily moved by knowledge, um, and um, not necessarily by powerful preachers, although that happened too. And with, you know, the Baptist community, of course, they are definitely... Um, inspired by powerful preachers. If you speak it really powerfully and really confidently and you exude a lot of force, then um, that's respected among a lot of those communities. But there was definitely um, a thing where people needed to solidify their faith through either being convinced by a lot of information, <clears throat> Uh, which would be a lot of the dispensationalist type stuff uh, because they believe that all, uh, most of this spiritual stuff when it comes to healing and, and speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues and praying in tongues and all that kind of stuff, um, which is basically spiritual, spiritually inspired gibberish, um, is that um, especially from my perspective, I was looking for an experience, especially when I was coming out of the Unitarian Church and just marinated in metaphysics. A lot of that was about experiences, and I had a lot of really weird shit that happened. And I come along into this uh, full gospel, charismatic Pentecostal stuff, and there was just a different form of weird shit. But here's what I'm saying is that um, these are folks who are attracted to the supernatural or anything they can't explain, and they have to say, well, if it's powerful, it, it, it must be God. And so um, that is kind of a form of crazy, because if something is creating an environment where if somebody claims that, oh, I got healed, or this pain left me, and then I went back home, and it came back, and then I went back to church, and the pain was gone, um, that uh, we need to challenge that. We need to find out what is going on in whatever spiritual realm that is creating these atmospheres, and they're strange. Um, I, I experienced a lot of this when I had my conversion experience. I went into the rescue mission, and it just, um, there happened to be a full gospel preacher there that night. And I could tell there was like a substance. There was definitely a spirit. There was an atmosphere in there. It, 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 I could almost see it like a fog, like it was a certain color. It, it just had a, um, not a, a fragrance or something. It was just different. Um, it's kind of like when you go to an old smoky bar and you just, the atmosphere, you can tell it's different. And then you go in, into a bank and it's just a whole different smell, a whole different feel. But this was something I never experienced before. It was really strange. And so one of the things about um, insanity, <laughs> I think that people uh, 
often don't recognize, especially when it comes to people that exhibit symptoms of a mental illness, is that it's really hard to differentiate between what is psychology and what is spirituality. There's definitely a lot of things that can exp be explained psychologically, um, if that's the right term. It's just that when we can't explain things anymore, for instance, when somebody is feeling pain and then that pain leaves in a certain environment where people are praying and worshiping, it's really hard to find a psychological explanation for that after a while. So we, we really have to sort this out. And I was talking to, there's this, um, I don't like these, um, most of these metaphysical practitioners are, are really, really interested in having a lot of influence over my life um, that has very little to do with my needs. <clears throat> and it's very draining of my energy. And and uh, and also my finances too, so I've had a lot of bad experiences with a lot of these metaphysical type folks, uh, which is very similar to a lot of the Bible-based stuff, where people just they throw advice at you. They just want a lot of control over your life. But there was one in particular that I I was asking about tongues. And um, this one practitioner who's very very new age. Um, did have a lot of very documented, unexplainable stuff that um, <clears throat> I know that um, she's very in touch with something. And she has a lot of theories about entities. And that's kind of a blanket explanation. Well, that's an entity. That's some kind of spirit or whatever that is tampering with our world. And um, that this uh, kind of biblical gibberish that people have tapped into, and they've documented this since 1901, although they do have um, other forms of documentation where it came and went in the context of the Catholic Church and probably the Orthodox Church and maybe even the early Protestant Church. Um, but they really didn't start, for lack of a better term, marketing on this tongues thing until the Pentecostal movement in the early 1900s, and that's an interesting um piece of history, the Azusa Street Revival, um, you know, Willie Seymour and how that was exported around the world. And it's still um, one of the fastest growing religious movements in the world. And it's been over a hundred years and it's taken hold of just about every corner of, of the, uh, the reached world that has been um, somehow influenced by Western culture. And I've seen it, too, when I was on the mission field as well. And so she was saying that the, the tongues could just be an entity influence. It could be a spirit that people are yielding to, that, that if it's bigger and better and more powerful than people's experience, they say it must be God. And when they yield to it, and especially when they have these um, impressions, which is called the interpretation of tongues, and it, it sort of resonates or it agrees with what other people are, are sensing, that they are having a shared experience with a spirit that is uh, very well could be infiltrating our world and trying to build its kingdom and <clears throat> ultimately draining the resources of our world and going into some other dimension. That's one way to, to think about it. Uh, it's just that... Um, post-Christians often have these explanations to try to figure out what the fuck happened, especially when they grow up, which is most post-Christians that I know. I only know like one or two others that were adult converts and that actually got out of that. Um, but it is, it is very different when you're introduced to that world. Um, but anyways, uh, I think I'll talk more about this later. My camera's going to run out in a second. <laughs> and, um, there's a lot of crazy when it comes to tapping into something spiritual that we really don't know the source of it and we just assume it's God. So I, that's something that I touched on earlier too. And uh, I think people really need to be more discerning and that's a tough thing to have.